Thanks for the promotion. Well, well, there we go. Good morning. Thanks for the promotion. I'm, I'm, I'm a patrol officer. I'm Officer Joe uh, with the Allegheny County Police. I'm the Community Relations Officer. I brought with me a cohort is uh, Lieutenant Sean Hudzinski. He's actually with the Port Authority of Allegheny County Police. Uh, and we'll bring some of that up in a little bit about mass transit in our area. Um, is that as bright as that gets? Or am I? Let me see how that looks on the next slide. So sorry about the technical difficulty. I don't know why my uh, uh, computer wasn't talking to the pr printer, but it just wasn't. There we go. Let me see if I can pull this up. I don't know how to use this daggone thing. There we go. That's me. <clears throat> so the gentleman was talking about his coupons and stuff. I had a situation where a friend of mine, anybody play the scratch off or the lottery? Anybody do that? Oh, does it? Okay. Okay, right. So this guy was, uh, he said to his wife one day, hey, what'd you do if I hit the lottery? She said, I'd take half of it and get the hell out of here. He says, good, here's your 16 bucks. I just hit a scratch off. <laughs> so. Thanks. So anyway, uh, I'm going I'm to talk to you about my, my presentations on pedestrian and driver safety for seniors, all right? As we get older, we kind of forget some of the things, the basics that we know. Uh, so when, during my presentation, you'll be like, oh yeah, I haven't thought of that for a while. And other things are going to be new to you that you didn't know. So that's what we're going to talk about. By no means do I think all this is going to be uh, an education to you because, again, you've been driving longer than me in a lot of cases, right? Uh, so a lot of it comes natural to you, but there's gonna be some little things you're gonna be like, yeah, I forgot about that, or I didn't realize that. Um, a little bit about me. I am the Crime Prevention and Community Relations Officer for Allegheny County Police. Uh, you look at me, I'm 60 years old, you think I've been a police officer forever. I've been a police officer for eight and a half years. This is my third career. I was in the Army until 2008. I used to recruit uh, mostly nurses, but doctors and nurses for the Army, and uh, retired in 2008. Taught high school for five years, which trained me to become a police officer, so <laughs> it was a natural transition. All right, so we'll go into the, uh, into the slideshow here. All right, so we're gonna start off with pedestrian safety. We, we see what uh, that looks like is a crosswalk, right? We all know that, that little greenish yellow thing in the middle is called a channel marker. That's actually placed poorly. Uh, those are supposed to be placed up to 50 feet before the crosswalk. And what that does is let the driver know, hey, beware, something could be coming up. You come up to it right here, it's kind of too late. You're already on top of it, right? <clears throat> so that kind of gives you some kind of knowledge. Hey, there's something to look out for up ahead, and there's pedestrians in it. And we'll talk a lot about crosswalks. I'm going the wrong way. No, proper placement, I talked about that. Okay, when planning to cross the street as a pedestrian, you're gonna cross only at marked crosswalks. I'm gonna put my glasses on. Cross only at marked crosswalks or intersections. Now, that's not always possible, so we'll talk that, about that as well. Make clear your intent to cross. Now, how many hear that pedestrians have the right-of-way? We have, we've all heard that, to a point. 
to a point they do. And in the vehicle code, it actually says, with, you know, uh, the onus is upon you to make it safe, make sure it's safe to enter that crosswalk. You can't just like, this is a crosswalk, so I'm going in, because there's a 4,000 pound car heading right at you, and he might not see you. So whether you're right or wrong, you want to be well. You don't want to be injured. Um, but where it says make clear your intent to cross, take that extra second. There's a car coming. Make eye contact with the driver before you step in the crosswalk. Uh, the onus is upon you to make sure that entry is safe before you go into that crosswalk uh, as much as it is on the driver to make sure he stops once you're in the crosswalk. So make eye contact with the driver. Maybe get a head nod or a wave before you walk through. If not, wait the extra second. Where else are we going, right? Let the car go by. Look left, look right, look left again. I, te I teach this to kindergarten kids, all right? And I have them do it with me. Okay, everybody look left, look right, look left again. What are we looking for, elephants? No, we're looking for cars, right? As you step into the crosswalk to continue to cross, continue to look left and right. That car could be coming around the corner a little fast. If vehicles are uh, so close to present a hazard, wait. And then, of course, we know what jaywalking is. It talks about jaywalking. Here's some common myths and, and statements about uh, crosswalks. A green light means that it's safe to cross. If you got a green light, right, it should be safe. Well, it's only partly true. It means may, you may stop and search for vehicles before you step off the curb, look left, look right, look left again. Should we all do that together like I do with the kindergarten kids? No, I'll let you, I'll let you off. If it's safe to do so, cross and keep looking left and right as you proceed. Be alert for vehicles, make it a right on red. You know, you might be looking for traffic coming the one way, but this traffic coming from the other way is gonna enter your crosswalk. You're safe in a crosswalk. You may cross at a crosswalk. Before you do, make sure you stop at the curb, look left, look right, look left again for vehicles. When it's clear, cross and keep looking left and right. Obviously, this looks like a a uh, typical crosswalk. I think this is actually in Butler County, but I'm not exactly sure. If you see the driver, the driver sees you, get that head nod, get that wave. Make sure that you, he knows that you're stepping into that traffic. Make sure the driver sees you and stops before you cross in front of the vehicle. And again, try to make cron uh, contact. The driver will stop if you're in a crosswalk or the green light. He may not see you. The driver's view may be blocked. He may do a right on red. He might not be looking. He might be distracted with his phone. We've all seen that. Okay, so when there's not a crosswalk, it's called mid-block mid mid crossing. If you must cross somewhere other than a light, keep these rules in mind. Stop at the edge of the curb and look for oncoming traffic. But if there's cars parked there, take a few more steps and stop at the edge of the car and look around the car. Look, you guys are all retired professionals. This isn't anything of an education to you, but it's a reminder. Hey, you know, maybe you take that extra step. Okay, when you're, uh, one of the nice things is if you're wearing proper clothing, is what this summarizes as. Uh, wearing dark colors in, at dusk, trying to do, take a walk, might not be the smartest things to do. When a police officer is directing traffic, what do you see? A bright greenish yellow vest. <clears throat> That's for a reason. It draws attention and alerts the driver that there's something in the way. All right, motoring and police interactions, they go hand in hand. Four major driving issues, aggressive driving. Seatbelt usage, we're gonna talk about that a couple of times today. Distracted driving and impaired driving. Okay, this is not the only time you're gonna see this during the presentation, wear a seatbelt. Now, when we started driving, and we were younger, uh, seat belts were non-existent. If they were anything, they were just little lap belts, and we tucked them down the seat because they were a pain in the ass, right? Okay. Uh, when I was, I think, six years old, I went through the windshield of my mom's car because I was standing up in the back seat. She had a panic stop, boom, and put a nice uh, dent in the windshield. So. That was common. We piled in the back of our station wagon, right, and rode to wherever, and all of our friends were in there. Things have changed now, and, and we've learned a lot, and we've evolved. Uh, there's still some people that don't use seatbelts, but for the majority of us, 
<clears throat> we are seat belted in a car, and that's a safe thing. And there's all kind of talk about how a seat belt should fit and everything. People take the seat belt, this part right here that comes across, and they put it behind them because it's in the way. Of course, you can't do that kind of a thing. It's not going to serve its purpose. Uh, that seat belt's meant to lock and hold you in place in the event of a panic stop or a crash that you're not going to fly around inside that car. I always tell people when there's a crash, there's four impacts. There's four collisions within a crash. And what those are is if your car's driving at 50 miles an hour and hits a pole, that's the first collision. The car stops. Now your body inside that car is still traveling at 50 miles an hour until it's either stopped by the seat belt or by the steering wheel, which will kill you. All right, that's the second collision. The third collision is after your body stops, your skeleton and your inner organs are still traveling at 50 miles an hour until they hit the inside of your skeleton, causing ruptures and hemorrhages and all kinds of things you doctors might know about. Then I always say there's a fourth uh, collision in this crash, and that's the books that are laying on the back seat are flying at 50, 50 miles an hour into the back of your head. Excuse me, it's cold outside. My nose runs a little bit, but it's cold. Um, so a seat belt takes a lot of that collision and a lot of that force out of the uh, equation. Be a defensive driver. Remain calm. Don't allow others to push your button. We'll talk about road rage. All right, we all know this. Check your tires. Does that mean now get down and make sure you got 33 pounds of air on your tires? No. Just do a walk around. If you see it looks bulge, okay, I might have to drive over to sheets and put some air in my tire. Uh, does the tread look good? Um, you know, do you want to be out there in semi bulge tires today? Probably not a good idea. <clears throat> I've, I've been to crashes on this kind of weather and have said, you know, sir, you, your car shouldn't be out on the road in the summertime with these tires, let alone in a snowstorm. All right, so know what your tires <clears throat> are capable of. Check your fuel level, especially in winter. Now, what's one of the reasons we would do that? Well, you don't want to run out of gas, right? But secondly, does anybody remember back in the 60s and 70s, the commercial for boron, right? We used to keep our fuel tanks at a quarter tank, never get below that because of why? Fuel line freeze up. Remember the commercial? No fuel line freeze up or boron pays a toe. Does that not echo in anybody's head? That still echoes in my head now in 2022. Um, we don't have that issue much anymore with fuel injectors. That was more of a carburetor thing. But still, let's use that as an idea. A quarter tank or more in your car. A couple of reasons. One, it gets cold outside. You're stuck on Interstate 95 like those guys were on Monday, and you have an eighth of a tank of gas, and you're going to be on the highway for 24 hours, you're going to get awful cold. Your car breaks down, you get stuck in the snow, you want to be able to run that heat and not get hypothermia while you're, while you're in your car waiting for help. So that's one of the main reasons. Clean working wiper blades, uh, mirrors, gauges, you know, just do a pre-check, you know, just like you would uh, with any time you get in your car. Just a couple of things to look over. And use your seatbelt. All right, so go back to crosswalks. Motorists, when you're approaching a crosswalk, slow down. Watch for pedestrians entering the roadway. Scan back and forth while driving. It's a good idea to look left and right, but you should scan everything in between. Anticipate, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, what could happen. You know, there's a playground right there. There's a chance a ball could kick out here and a kid's chasing it. Uh, yield to pedestrians. The law requires motorists stop for pedestrians in designated crosswalks. Um, you know, it's, it's good practice to even stop for them if they're not in a crosswalk, all right? You don't want to hit them and put a dent in your car. All right. Think safety first. Be aware of your surroundings, all right? Be aware of the road conditions, the weather. Pay attention and stay focused. Watch out for the other driver. They're not going to be watching out for you, for you most likely. Okay. Everybody remember this, the three to four second rule? Or when we were driving, we were taught three to four, you know, one car length for every 10 miles per hour that you follow. Uh, in, in normal traffic, if we're doing 40 miles an hour down the road, you want to be at least four car lengths behind that car. Same kind of thing, but now they call it the three to four second rule. So you watch when that car passes that, I don't know, mile marker sign, 
and then count 1001, 1002. If you pass that same point before you get to 1004, you're probably going too close. So you can use that. That's the new thinking. Instead of the one mile or one car length for every 10 miles an hour, it's 1001, 1000 until you get to 1004. And if you pass that point, you might be going a little too fast or a little too close. Um, but we'll talk about it today. You want to even double that, right? Because if somebody stops in front of you today, you may not be able to stop so quickly. Separate the risks. <coughs> Excuse me. You have to do that on a day like today. The risk of, uh, you know, the, the fact that I could slide on ice or I can pass this car. Uh, on the way here, I had a tractor trailer next to me on 65 coming right in that area when you come around uh, from Heinz Field past the casino and before you get to the main stretch there. I, I just didn't like that tractor trailer beside me. I didn't I had to separate the risk. I have to get past him because I don't want him sliding into my lane or me sliding in his lane. Cut down distractions. All right, we all have distractions in the car. One of the main ones is our cell phone, right? Uh, what's another distraction in the car? The person you've been married to for 45 years sitting next to you nagging you, right? <laughs> so, yeah, that could be a distraction because we get in arguments. When we get that argument, we got to get our point across. And we got to get our point across, we're not watching the road. So, keep in mind, you got to watch for distractions. Driving in rain or snow, like today, increase your distance between the vehicles. Allow for more stopping distance. You're not going to be able to stop in the same, with the same efficiency as you would if the roads weren't bad, obviously. Don't use cruise control. If the roads are snow covered, and now today's car is a little smarter than, than in the past, but still, do you want to leave that decision making for your car when you, know, you see the road conditions, you know what could happen any second? That car doesn't know that that road slip. At least the cruise control does. Maybe your tires, your traction control system, and all that does. But you know, take, take cruise control out of the equation. Don't oversteer or overcorrect. We've seen skid marks on the road before where you can tell that the skid marks go off the road this way and then they come over this way and there's where the crash was. You see the mark on the wall, you see the telephone pole has got damage to it. And what happened most likely is that driver caught himself going off the road, overcorrected, and brought that back in and ended up losing control of the car. Try not to panic. It's hard to tell. Hard to say that. All right, with the telephones, obviously it's safest to pull over and make a phone call. Hardly any of us do that. However, that's gonna be the safest way. But please don't find yourself trying to dial the phone while you're driving, all right? Keep your eyes and mind on the road. Limit the in-car conversations. We talked about that uh, a little while ago to casual conversation and not emotional conversations. Keep your hands on the wheel and focus on the task at hand, which is driving. All right, mixing alcohol and medication. We all have prescriptions we gotta take every day. No, discuss with your doctor, first of all, how that might interact if you partake in a little bit of the uh, adult beverages. Uh, before going out on the road though, if you have a new prescription and you are gonna have a drink, have a drink at a time you're not gonna be driving to see what that medicine might do to you with a uh, mixture of alcohol. Never operate a vehicle under the influence, we all know that. Um, does anybody know what the, the, the blood alcohol content is allowed to be for a driver, uh, what, what's considered legally drunk in, in the state of Pennsylvania? 0 .08. 0 .08. And so it's eight one hundredths of a percent of alcohol in your blood, so that's not very much. Um, or eight tenths of one, yeah, point oh eight, eight one hundredths. So, know how your body reacts to alcohol before you drive. Know the effects about your prescription, and as well as over the counter. If I take a, uh, what's that thing for allergies that you can take over the counter, but it knocks me right the heck out, uh, I will fall asleep driving. When in doubt, don't do it. Now, let's talk about uh, medications. Just as bad as uh, <clears throat> alcohol impairment or other drug impairment mixtures, how about lack of taking your medication? I've been on traffic stops before 
where I thought this person was going to be definite DUI, <clears throat> ended up calling an ambulance to get this guy to the hospital because his blood sugar was through the roof. He hadn't taken his uh, medications for that. So, you know, the lack of medication could be just as bad as taking medications, uh, over medicating or taking alcohol with your medications. <clears throat> Some new laws that are out there. Anybody ever hear the steer clear law? Okay. Anybody not familiar with it? I'm going to tell you about it anyway. Okay, good. Um, what's called emergency response area on the side of the road. You got a tow truck, police car, fire truck, ambulance, flashing lights going on on the side of the road. We've all done that. Oh, that guy's getting a ticket. We watch him as we go by. Sometimes we even look to see what the driver's face looks like while he's like, oh crap, I'm going to get a ticket. The law in Pennsylvania now is as you're approaching an emergency response zone, um, you are required to get over one complete lane, travel lane, from that scene. So when you go by that scene, you're at least one lane over. What about a case where you can't get over? There's a semi there, I can't get into that lane, or there is no lane. This is just a two lane road, right? Well then you're required to slow down to 20 miles an hour below the speed limit. So if it's a 45 zone, you're slowing down to 25, getting past it, and then going back up to speed. Um, why do you think that is? Well, there's been many times that officers on the side of the road, and when we're driving down the road and we see something like that, what do we do? We tend to steer where we're looking. Those lights make you look in that direction, and you, you tend to steer in that direction, and there's been way too many crashes, and police officers and other emergency workers have been injured or killed and that kind of thing. I myself have almost lost my couple inches off my rear. I don't have much back there to begin with, so I have nothing to spare. Um, so yeah, the steer clear law, that's a new law since we became drivers. Other laws, we know about construction zones, fines doubled. Right? They now have cameras. PennDOT allows cameras, speed cameras in construction zones. My son got a ticket mailed to him. It was a warning only. They have to give you a warning. I think the first two times, I think it is. And then they start stacking fines. But uh, my son just got a ticket last week in the mail. Picture of him going through his uh, construction zone. He was doing 45 and a 25 mile an hour construction zone. So they're out there. School zones, that's big stuff. <clears throat> Officers will often paint the lines right in a school zone. Watch that you go through that at 15 miles an hour. And they write tickets at 17. Uh, they don't give much break there. If you turn your windshield wipers on, you have to turn one more thing on. That's your headlights. That's a law in Pennsylvania. It's been out there for about, I guess about 12 years now, something like that. T today, you have to go out and remove all the snow and ice off your car before you start driving down the road. What's the reason for that? Well, when you get in the car and you've got a sheet of ice snow on your roof, and you get that car nice and warm, the, the roof starts melting that snow, and then you shut that car off, and now that snow turns to ice. Next time you get in that car, you warm it back up, you drive, that ice is now separating, getting warm, and separating from the metal, it gets a little bit of wind under there. That can lift up like a mattress and come back and land on a car behind you. And if something like that happens and it causes an injury, that, that driver gets in a crash and gets hurt, now you're, you are legally, uh, criminally uh, culpable. So uh, clear your snow off your car. Make sure you can see out the window. Look, we've all done this to include me before I became a police officer, of course cleared off an area about this big so you can start getting down the road and hopefully the defrosters will do the work by the time you get you know out onto the highway right can't do that it's against the rules children left in a vehicle we're going to talk about transporting children because we have grandchildren we have great grandchildren right so anybody many people have heard stories well I just got gas in the car and I run inside to get go to pay for it I'm going to leave my grandchild in the car seat in the car. Well, under, under five, if that happens, you could be arrested. Right? That's, they, they cannot be left alone in a car five and under. Um, let's talk more about car seats. 
and, and transporting children. Um, anybody drive their grandkids around? Nobody? Of course we do, right? Um, the laws in Pennsylvania, there's a graduating system for uh, seat belt or child restraints, all right? From zero to two, that child has to be in a car seat that's rear facing until the age of two. Now, sometimes a car seat manufacturer says up to 40 pounds and this and that and the other. Uh, follow those guidelines with the state law in, in mind. Uh, why I say that is officers don't carry a scale on the side of the road. So we're not going to pull you over and weigh that kid. So follow the uh, guidelines on that. But the two years old is rear facing. That's the law. You're allowed to turn that child around in a forward facing from age two to four. However, if that child is still comfortable in a rear facing position, that's the safest place, the safest position for them in the car in the event of a crash, as long as that car seat's installed correct. If you have a car seat that you put in your car, so for the occasional transportation of grandchildren or great grandchildren or whatever, and you're not sure exactly how that goes in, most fire, EMS, or police stations have a certified technician that can help install that car seat safely for you. So just reach out to any police department, local police department and ask about a car seat technician and they have them. <clears throat> Excuse me. So now we have that four year old that's forward facing in a car seat, but now he's four and he's starting to grow a little bit bigger. Then you can put him in a booster seat and that booster seat, they have to be in that until they're eight years old. Why a booster seat? Well, when you're a four-year-old or five-year-old in a car and you're sitting on the seat, this part of the seat belt comes across you about, right about here, for the most part. There's some bigger kids, but for the most part. And what that booster seat does is bring that child up so that seat belt goes across the strong of their body, right across their rib cage from their shoulders. Um, so that's why they have to be in a booster seat until they're eight years old. Now. Grandchildren older than that, they're 15, 16. They're the cock of the walk, right? They know what they're doing. They still have to be in a seatbelt anywhere in the car up until the age of 18 is the law. Now, we all know the front seat driver and front seat passenger always have to be seatbelted, right? That's a law. That's called a secondary offense, though. If I'm driving down the road in the patrol car and I see you going by and you don't have your seatbelt on, I can do nothing about it. I keep on driving. Maybe get them behind you. And then you don't use your turn signal. Oh wait, that's a primary offense, the turn signal. So I do a traffic stop and I cite you for the seat belts as well because that's a secondary offense. I have to have something else in front of that before I can give you a ticket uh, for the seat belt. But now guess what? You got two tickets. So for adults, that's a secondary offense. For juveniles, for minors, that's a primary offense. If I'm driving down the road and I see your 13-year-old grandchild in that car without a seatbelt, there's a ticket for you, All right? So child passenger safety is a primary offense as, of, as opposed to a secondary offense for, for adults. Turning on red. This changed since we got our driver's license, right? Yeah, you're allowed to make a right on red. That wasn't taught to us when we were kids. So sometimes we still find ourselves forgetting you can make a right on red. Am I right? We all have done it. <clears throat> Any case you can make a left on red? Anybody? If you were on a one way and turning onto a one way that's left, you can make a left on red. A lot of people don't know that. So that's one of those things that said, hey, I learned something today. All right, most of this other stuff you knew. But there's a new point you got. <clears throat> All right, so Pennsylvania often has task forces. Yes, sir? What does stop here on red mean? Does that mean that you stop and just look for clearance? Or does that mean that you have to stay there until the light changes? No, when, so there's a difference between stop here on red and no turn on red. So the stop here on red is just a line they want you to pull up to, to make sure it either A, activates the light, or B, gives you enough vantage that you can see into the intersection to continue on. That's different from no turn on red. 
pay aggressive driving. There are task forces we have out occasionally that will patrol the parkways or the interstates just to watch for aggressive drivers. Does that mean people out there that are banging on people's hoods? Not necessarily. People that are getting up on people's rear ends too close, people that uh, are changing lanes without signaling, those kind of things. Okay, the behaviors of uh, aggressive drivers, speeding, following too closely, we just talked about that, improper passing and lane changing, uh, running red lights. All right, we drive down the road and that guy comes up behind us and he's flicking his headlights at us and he's like mad that you're in his way. Get move over, let him go. Let him be somebody else's problem. Why engage him? Pay attention to the road, don't let that distract you. And take a deep breath, count to 10, keep comments and gestures to yourself. You don't want to salute them when they drive by, okay? You're just gonna provoke, you're just gonna cause a reaction. And you, of course report any road rage to us. You never know what could happen. The guy get out with a tire iron and want to beat on your hood. Don't confront the driver. Get out of their way and let them pass. Put your pride aside, avoid eye contact, ignore the dress, uh, aggression. Okay, I talked about this earlier, about the force of a crash and your seatbelt takes that all out of the equation. I talked about, I got ahead of myself, I guess, with the uh, child safety seat. Um, again, so AAA has a program called CarFit. <clears throat> If you find yourself not getting to the age where it's a little hard to feel comfortable in the car, you know, we start to shrink down, that seatbelt's in our way, we find ourselves getting up on the steering wheel too close, find it harder getting in and out of the car, AAA has a program that they show you devices and, and so on that make your driving easier uh, in the car and more comfortable. So you can reach out to AAA East Central in East Liberty and they can send a presenter out. Uh, it's called CarFit, CarFit, uh, where they fit you to sit in your car comfortably. And they guide you through, you know, 12 inches from the steering wheel and this is how the seat belt goes and this will help this, you make that transition from the car to getting out of the car. Okay, and stay safe out there. I can open it up to any questions anybody has. Yes, sir. Do you have any uh, <clears throat> concern about cars steering themselves? Autonomous, really autonomous driving. Uh, I don't even know why they have to. Yeah, um, I, guess they, I guess they think that's going to be safer in the future, which I imagine it will evolve, and the car takes the driver error out of the equation. But... I'm not necessarily a fan yet, um, so a good question. Let me ask this before I turn it over to all questions. <clears throat> Anybody here use public transportation at all, mass transportation? Okay. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, again, my colleague with the Port Authority of Allegheny County Police is here. Uh, if you have any questions about uh, dealing with buses, overtaking buses, uh, duties at a bus stop, or anything along that line, Please direct the questions uh, to us, and I'll pass. I'll hand it over to Sean at that point. Okay. Any other questions about the presentation? Yes, sir. When I come up to an intersection. There's a big sign that says right turn signal. Uh huh. In other words, the right turn signal. As long as there's no sign that says no turn on red, absolutely. No, it does. Okay, as long as it doesn't say right turn. Right. Yeah, the law is you're allowed to make a red on red unless it's posted otherwise. Very good. Very good. No, yes, sir. stopped but she didn't and she ran she sprattled over my hood she hit, ran right into the front of my car she was texting or something mm -hmm. wasn't looking and I jumped out of the car and asked her if I could take her to the hospital because she hit the ground she slid off the hood and went down but she got up and she said she didn't want to go and uh, left and I just happened to on a policeman not too far from there, and I asked him about it, 
And he said, well, I think I saw her running later. Don't worry about it. But I still think about that. Oh, I'm sure you do. Uh, and, and I don't, you know, I don't, where, where does my liability in there? It, it didn't. I mean, if she were to the next day say, as long as she had your information, she had your plate number, hey, he hit me yesterday, I woke up today, I hurt like hell, you know, I'm going to go to the doctors, <clears throat> it's going to come back to you. Um, I think you can rest assured that it's not going to come back to you at this point. You know, it's been long enough. She's forgotten yeah. about it. Yeah. She probably ran home to Paul Edgar Schneider. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> More questions? Uh, sir. Uh, so that's a local city, it's not even an ordinance, a directive for the city of Pittsburgh. It's not anywhere else in this area, just city of Pittsburgh. And I don't know how they can tell a police officer he can't enforce the law. So I'm, I'm not real a fan of that law. Let me tell you why. I, taught, I, was, I taught this, was taught this when I learned to become a police officer. People that don't take care of their lives don't take care of their cars. So what I mean by that is that person's tail lights out. If your tail lights out, you take it down to the mechanic or you run down to advance auto yourself and get it taken care of, right? People that don't take care of their lives, that's the least thing that they're worried about is a tail light. So I see a car without a tail light, I pull it over. As I approach the car, I see the person squirming. Oh, there's a gun in the car. There have been more guns pulled out of cars and drugs pulled out of cars on those kind of traffic stops because that gave us our introduction to that crime. And uh, <clears throat> I guess the, the thinking is, well, sometimes they go bad because the person resists and fights back. Well, that's a different thing altogether. So I, I can go on a fit of tangent on that, but nowhere else but the city of Pittsburgh in this area. So, but wait, City of Pittsburgh Police, Port Authority Police can see you without a tail light going down Liberty Avenue, they can pull you over. Allegheny County Police sees you with a turn, will not use your turn signal on Grant Street, I can pull you over. So, just the City of Pittsburgh Police are under that scrutiny by their counsel. Okay, uh, Sean, question for you. Uh, if a, you know, Port Authority bus pulls over and they're letting people off the bus, how do you proceed around the bus if it's stopped and because you know you could have people getting out and walking in front of the bus and absolutely i'm very glad you asked because i was going to interject that anyways although you may not take public transportation I'm sure there's quite often where you're behind buses that are unloading, okay? And you can pass a bus if the road permits. If it's not a double, lot, double yellow line, you are permitted to go around the bus. But if you're going to do so, I highly suggest you do so very slowly. Um, I've been firsthand on scene of a lot of traffic accidents involving pedestrians getting off buses, and that's how they occur. People stepping off the bus and running out from the front, trying to get across the street. But another thing you can do when you're passing that bus is just keep an eye on that left front wheel of that bus. You will see the shadow of that person, and, and it's just become a habit with me. When I pass a bus, I look at that wheel, and if I see a shadow, I'm stopping and, and just seeing, because you will see the shadow of that person at that wheel as they're attempting to cross in front of that bus. But again, you can pass the bus as long as there's not a double yellow line, that's no problem. But please do so carefully because a lot of pedestrians are hit and often killed that way. One more thing to add about buses too is, I know you don't take buses, but I'm sure you've crossed in front of them. Please don't always assume that the bus driver sees you because it's quite often, in fact, it's always been the case in my experience with accidents between buses and pedestrians, that the driver did, obviously didn't see the pedestrian. There's a lot going on on the bus. There's the, the frame on the bus. There's just you know different things going on. And unfortunately, if they do hit you, they're not going to realize it till after, till after they've completed their turn. And by then, it's way too late. Just let the bus go. Let it go through the intersection and cross after it's out of the way because you are not going to win that fight, unfortunately. And, and it's, it's so tragic. And all the time that what we find out is I, I, the driver didn't see him. They didn't know. But it's after they've already run over the pedestrian and it's just it's usually fatal by that point. So just please be careful in those, um, when crossing with those buses. Just let them go and, and cross after them. Thanks, Sean. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so when it's safe to do so, dial 911 on your car, on your, on your phone. Uh, <clears throat> things you'll need to report is what road you're on, what's the direction of travel. 
the color and type of vehicle. If you can get a plate, great. That helps us more because <clears throat> now we don't have to come look for the guy. We'll just pull up in his driveway and go have a conversation with him. And most road rage incidents are because that guy's having a bad day too. And we go there and we discern that. And we're like, look, bud, you scared this person. You know, what are you doing? Other times, you know, where it took, takes, rises to the level of criminal activity, the guy, you know, got out and kicked your fender or something like that, <clears throat> then we have to take that kind of action. Sir? So I've not. Uh, Sean, would you maybe? Yes. We have seen it a lot with the bus operator. They've encountered a lot of road rage, particularly in the last year, just with tensions are a little high with things. So, yeah, you think? And I, I'm a, I mean, I've been behind a bus in my personal vehicle, and I gotta get somewhere. And this bus is stopping every 60 feet, <laughs> holding me up. Did you have a question? Uh, school buses on a four-lane road. Is everybody required to stop in all four lanes? With the red lights flashing, absolutely, unless there is a barrier of some sort, which could be just a concrete curb, which is a separate uh, part of travel. Then, um, so yes, absolutely. Uh, and and uh, you're, you're required to stop. Uh, I think it's 10 feet before that bus. Actually, if it's if you're actually on coming to it, they have cameras now, and those little stop signs that pop out. Should you run through, it gets a shot of your plate. I got two questions. One is I'm noticing more and more that when people, uh, uh, law enforcement officers, make a traffic stop, they kind of can't their car out is that to protect so that if a car doesn't see it and hits it 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 could do two ricochets things ricochets off kind of that's one of the reasons but secondly it's just a buffer it's one other thing well, before too, it hits yeah. me yeah absolutely we do that on purpose if you notice the, the traffic uh, vehicles stopped here the police officer stopped like this and it's sticking out maybe two feet further yeah than the vehicle and that's to give me some room and it, it help deflect it yeah. Good, good point. Se second question yeah. is, uh, um, I notice in riding with other friends and seeing other drivers, a severe lack of what's called situational awareness. And it's not taught, to my knowledge, in any driver education program. And it's, it's a skill that absolutely can be taught to people. So it's, it's good situational awareness in traffic as well as in non-traffic. If you're yeah. <clears throat> downtown Pittsburgh in a car, you want to be aware of the pedestrians that are around. I mean, well, yeah, everything around you, the guy absolutely. behind you, you know, because a lot of times you'll stop for and they won't. panic stop. And, you, and the first thing I do is look in my rearview mirror. Is somebody going to hit me from behind? That's right. I'm going to be ready. So you got to know everything around your car. And we're taught in law enforcement, it's called keep your head on a swivel, you know. This doesn't have much to do with rules of the road, but I had an experience yesterday. I was at the gym and my wife calls me. She was supposed to be getting her hair done. You got to come and trade cars. I said, what, what happened? I got a flat. Well, what she did, she was looking in the mirror, fixing her damn hair and went off the road. But mm -hmm. I knew. But I didn't say. Oh no! You know he won't win that one. <laughs> I didn't say it, but when I got there, I looked for a pothole. Couldn't find one. But I have been a member of three A's for years and years and years. And since I worked in the insurance field, I said to my agent, "What does your road service cost, and what does it cover?" The road service from the insurance company is six bucks every six months. But I was really worried when I needed them if they, if I, they were going to be there because my wife would say, see, I told you. But here, it was so fantastic. When I got to the car, the, she had them on the phone. State Farm, this is. He asked me to turn my phone on, and he pinged. I don't know. Well, he said he pinged. I don't know what the hell that means. But he said, that'll tell me exactly where you are. That's great. In 30 seconds, a tow truck pulled up. He got out, changed the tire, put everything back in the truck. The tire was shot. I had to go to the tire shop. But the point I'm trying to make is you pay $100 a year 
to 3A and with the advent of navigation system, I don't know what else you use 3A for. You can get it for six bucks every six months. Yeah. And it's fantastic. Oh, I, yeah, through your insurance company, talk to your agent, I'm sure. Bring in your insurance policy and you don't need 3A. Very good. Another question. Sir? Yeah, this has to do with the crossing guards. Okay. It seems like every time I go through a town, the crossing guards do the job, but they must off me on the green light and let these students come across on the red light. So that's unfortunate. Yeah, I mean, I give, that's not what's supposed to be done. No, it's not. I give, I give training to crossing guards often, and they are not able to direct a motorist to break the law or a pedestrian to break the law. And that's exactly what they're doing. Only a police officer or a fire emergency personnel can do that in emergency situations. So obviously there's a police officer directing traffic and there's a stop sign there, but he's waving you straight through. You can continue to roll through that kind of thing. A crossing guard cannot, is not supposed to. Doesn't mean you can keep going and run those kids over though. That's not gonna end up well for you. So. So that, that's poor training on that uh, crossing guards uh, part. I, I teach that to them all the time. I, yeah, you can cross these kids, but you still have to wait until the light turns green to cross them and then make sure no one comes through that intersection. Uh, just a cute story. Uh, you see a lot of big signs on, uh, on interstates or the turnpike, you know, be careful, weather conditions, etc. Uh, I was driving in Canada on the road and there's a big sign that says, did you run out of bl uh, blinker fluid? <laughs> I like that. I thought you were going to say about moose, but yeah, it's Blaker fluid. I love it. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, in the event that I ever do get pulled over, should I just sit there or should I start getting my driver's license and... Very good question. So, there's, you know, first of all, if anybody carries concealed firearms with them, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about that as well. On a traffic stop, you notice lights behind you hey there's a policeman he wants to talk to me make sure it's an area that's safe for both you and he when you pull over what i mean by that is if you're coming down 65 right here into swickley you don't just stop in that lane right there if you're going down <laughs> and i had this happen on 376 in the left lane and stop right in that lane we're in the speed lane and this guy wants to stop and you think i'm gonna i'm like no we get you know, I'm yelling at the guy at this point. It's frustrating. So keep your cool, because you're not going to keep your cool. You're going to be like, oh, crap, what's this guy want? What I do? Um, but try to keep your cool. Try to find a spot that's safe for you and the officer, and signal your intention. Slow down, put your turn signal on. Like, like look, guy, I'm just looking for a spot. Okay, here it is. Um, I would keep my hands on the steering wheel until the officer makes his approach. It's going to be maybe a couple of minutes before he gets there because he's got a computer beside him and he's running your plate. And that plate says it's Bill Smith. And then, oh, boom, there's Bill Smith's picture and his driver's license as well. So it takes a couple minutes to do all that. And then he scrolls down, is there any warrants for Bill Smith? I mean, he's trying to make this stop, stop as safe for him as possible. It might say, you know, warning, there's a warrant for this guy for shooting at somebody. Well, guess what? I'm going to wait until I have friends show up to, before I come talk to you. Okay? So now you're sitting there on the side of the road with your hands on the steering wheel. The officer's making his approach. Now you expect him to come up. You roll down your window. But wait, he's not coming there. He comes around to the passenger side. What? Well, a couple of reasons that we do that. One is to keep our skinny butts out of traffic. But another thing is we can see more into that car from a passenger's uh, side than we can see on the driver's side. First of all, if you're on the driver's side, if I'm on the driver's side and you're a driver, most of us are right-handed. Where are you gonna keep your firearm? Where I can't see because your body's blocking it. If I'm on the passenger side, I have full view of your right side, all right? So he's gonna say, hi, how you doing? He's gonna give you a greeting, most likely. <clears throat> Very few traffic officers are going to come up and say, what the hell were you doing? You know, they're going to come up and say, hey, sir, I'm Officer Rich with the Calvagini County Police. I noticed that you rolled through that stop sign back there. Is, there anything, is everything all right today? He's going to kind of find out. Cause you may stare up at him and be in a medical emergency. Now he's got to act. You might be having a bad day. I don't know, I just ran through. What the hell do you want? You know, now it changes. 
our, our, how, how that traffic stop goes is fluid. It could be a pleasant thing and look, look, bud, you, know, you got to be aware of what, you, what your surroundings are when you're driving. All right, you be safe, have a good day, and then leave. Or press, press hard, you're making four copies. You know, you could get a ticket. Um, keep your hands there. He says, okay, well, I'm going to need your, uh, he most likely isn't going to need your driver's license and registration. He already has it on his computer, most likely. Some small departments don't have that. <clears throat> he is going to need to see your insurance card if it goes to that level. You know, he may just be, want to come up and address what the violation was and tell you not to do it again. Like, I shake my finger at you very hard because that's much easier than making you pay $136, whatever a ticket is now, and then the, fi the paperwork that I have to file for that. <laughs> so it's much easier just to shake my finger at you really hard. Uh, now, if it's egregious, and he has to give you a ticket, then he will. But keep your hands on the steering wheel. If he says, okay, I need to see your insurance card, then you say, it's in the glove compartment. You say, okay, but I reach for it. And he'll say, okay, and, you know, and he'll just watch you do it. If you have a firearm, Concealed carry permit, you, and the firearm is under your suit jacket. Say, officer, I just want to let you, most likely he's going to know that anyway. It's going to show on his computer you have a concealed carry permit. But officer, just want to let you know my firearm is on my shoulder or on my hip or whatever, uh, but I'm not going to reach for it. He'll go, okay, just keep your hands where I can see them. That's all. You're just a person that carries a firearm like I do. And that's how that interaction should go. Yes? Mm -hmm. What was that police department that always would write Tick Hillbuck? Is that it? Yeah. Right. I don't know. And that, that, that road's well known for that, too, as far as the tickets and getting and so, so on. So I can't tell you that. Whether it's a manpower thing, whether they're shifting their focus to something else. Sean, do you know anything to add? No, no. I know Killbuck's not down there anymore. I believe Ohio Township controls that now. I think they took over they that. They Well, right. And, and they're going to have to do that again. Another question, sir. Very good question. And you don't have a concealed carry permit. So, you need to be, first of all, removed from your firearm. You need to have it not loaded. So it's good just, if you have a semi-automatic, take the slide off, take the magazine out, put it in a gun box, put it in the, in the trunk. You can drive down like that. If you have it on the seat, inside the cash department of your car, or on the floor, then you're actually you're concealing it. And that's illegal. You can be, it's a felony. You can be arrested for that. Uh, so if you're going to transport it, disassemble it. No, if it's separated like that, I believe you're good, right? If it's locked in the trunk. It's not loaded, though. It can't, be, yeah. it can't be loaded in the trunk. And so it should be in a place where you cannot Right. Absolutely. But, and it should be disabled. I mean, take the slide off, pop the magazine out. Yeah, just pull it, yeah. If you have a permit, yeah, absolutely. You can have it strapped right on your side while you're in the car. Once you, if you don't, in any case, Pennsylvania is an open carry state. So you could walk down cowboy style down the street doing this, you know. But the minute you open that car door and sit inside there, it's concealed. It's not open carry anymore. That's <laughs> Sir. Uh, let's say hypothetically I have a friend or spouse. Oh, okay. Wait a second. He's, this is a, a this is self admittal. Go ahead. <laughs> who is not a good driver, and they can't be talked out of driving. Is there a uh, governmental option for? So such? there is, and I'm not familiar enough to educate that. I don't know if you are, Sean. Uh, yeah, you, you can. You can reach out to a police officer local police department and plead your case to that officer and they can send in to have that driver retested at the very least. Um, I've had people reach out to me for and I've had people retested for that reason because they just they don't want to give up that license and hey if nothing else you're
getting them retested, and at least you're assuring that they are capable of safe driving. So I'd reach out to your local police and plead your case about that, and they may be willing to submit to have that person retested. Oh, they have to. Once yeah, once they're notified. Yeah, that's it. They have to be retested. Absolutely. Do you have to tell the officer who you are? You do. Yes. I will. He will, he's not going to do it unless you tell him. He's not going to say, Jim said you can't drive anymore. <laughs> right. He's not going to tell that person. Oh, okay. No, no. No. Yeah, but you have to file a report and identify who you are. Oftentimes, their doctors will, will do that, initiate that paperwork as well. Yeah. More questions? Anyone? Okay. This is, this is, oh, wait, alibi. Here we go. Oh. Thanks for recognizing it. And whenever you, whenever you approach an officer, whether you see him on the street or in a shopping center or whatever, and you go up and shake his hand and thank him for his service, they appreciate that. Officers appreciate that. We know that we got support. And, and that doesn't get reported on the news as much as the FU police uh, gets on the news. All right? But we know there's more of you out there than of that. We are in a crime crisis. Absolutely. Thanks for the recognition. We appreciate it. Okay. And thank you for your attention. It was a great, great presentation. Audience. I'm getting a donut. Officer Richard, Officer Sean, thank you very much for coming.